uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. And uh, Brad and Don, Brad Haney and Don Mutter are going to, I guess, be kind of doing this together. And then, so I will get out of the way and you guys go to it. All right. All of our presentation will be a short two hour and 20 minute film. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to do an uh, introduction, or do you, uh, want, do you want me to just go? So, uh, <laughs> essentially, this is going to be in two parts. Uh, Brad has done quite a bit of thinking on what they got right, what they got wrong about the science and the astrophysics of 2001 Space Odyssey. And I'm super excited, uh, both as a techie and as an uh, astronomer, for the implications of AI for um, the future of space travel, and obviously, that has, has anyone not seen 2001 Space Odyssey in this room? Are you being serious? Really? Yeah. Spoiler oh, alerts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a computer plays a very central role in this yeah. game. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, and there's some interesting things we can say about that, so I think, uh, Brad will kick us off sure. uh, with the science of it, and then I'll take us away with the, uh, the doom and gloom of artificial intelligence. What year did they make it? Oh, well, I was going to talk about that. I was going to talk about that. Um, yeah, so, so I, yeah, that I was basically going to give a little bit more, more than just the science of it and that kind of thing. So we have one person here who has not seen it. Um, so, okay. So as you as you guys, as you guys know, so I, I, this is going to involve a couple of spoiler alerts. Uh, however, I don't think that spoilers are really germane to this film because it's a very unusual film. Um, well, there's, so, there's so much of pop culture too. You've probably seen plenty of references. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I mean, if we want to have, if we want to make this a discussion, that's that's all. That's really great. But I just kind of wanted to tell a little bit about the history of the film and then what it got right and wrong in astronomy. Because one of the things that I always enjoyed about it was watching it over and over again and seeing all the little details and the minutia in the film. Um, it has long been probably what I would consider to be my favorite film of all time. I've probably seen it. 45 or 50 times, you know, from beginning to end. If I'm, you know, not feeling too well or life is getting me down, I'll sit down and watch 2001 A Space Odyssey and find some other little detail in the corner which I never noticed before because the filmmakers thought about that. The, 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 the director of 2001 A Space Odyssey was a gentleman who you probably heard of named by the name of Stanley Kubrick, hot off the heels of his wildly successful and superb film, if you've never seen it, extremely funny, one of my favorite movies of all time, Dr. Strangelove, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Um, that was fairly successful, and it was moderately what one would call science fiction. It involved technology going wrong and that kind of thing. But Stanley Kubrick wanted to do something more. He wanted to make, in the words of Arthur C. Clarke, the proverbial good science fiction movie. Those, that's, that's how he described it. And so he wanted to actually get everything as right as he could. So the first thing he did was he brought on um, a rather well-noted uh, science fiction writer of the day that did the type of science fiction that he was interested in, and that was Arthur C. Clarke. You know Arthur C. Clarke from Rendezvous with Rama uh, and a few childhood and Childhood's End, and he was a progenitor of what was then called, and is probably still called today, hard science fiction. Science fiction that involves mostly adherence toward the physical laws of the universe as we know them. Uh, and Arthur C. Clarke was, heck yeah, I'm going to do this. Uh, it was actually thought that uh, Arthur C. Clarke was, in fact, a recluse. You know, everybody had this reputation that, that he was a recluse, but actually he just kind of liked living in Sri Lanka where the weather was nice. And when, they, when he was given the opportunity, he went back to uh, work with Stanley Kubrick uh, for four years to work on this film. He was intimately a part of the movie. So that's standing on the left, Arthur on the, on, Arthur on the right, and they're standing on one of the sets of the film. Um, the film involved an extraordinary amount of technology. I mean, for the day, um, I, if you're a sci-fi fan and you've watched a lot of films from the 50s and maybe the early 1960s, 
you know that the special effects can be a little marginal, you know. Um, but Stanley Kubrick, to this day, I think, has not been surpassed in the excellence of the, of the special effects. And consider that it is all done with models, most of it in camera, most of it, you know, before the days of, you know, computers were the size of rooms in those days. He had to pretty much invent everything from scratch. He and his uh, uh, special effects advisor, Douglas Trumbull, who went on to do like Silent Running and some of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, Alien and that kind of thing. He was the guy that uh, headed up all of those things. But those special effects, you know, spaceships in space looking real, um, were done in this film first. Uh, there was, they kind of insisted on getting things really, really right, um, and in so doing, they actually ended up building, uh, for one of the main sets of the film, the middle section of the film, this giant, uh, wheel here, which, you know, all of the, uh, the set was actually built in the wheel, and as the actors walked around on the inside of a, a torus that was spinning to generate gravity, getting the science right, um, they actually had to turn the film, turn the, uh, the, the, the set in order to get it proper. And everything uh, that they had inside of that had screens and uh, different, uh, 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 different like computer over overlays and things like that. None of that stuff had been invented yet. Computer screens were extremely rudimentary in those days, and so they had to invent a way of having screens project uh, computer-like things on the uh, on these uh, on these monitors, and and they ended up uh, actually using real, honest to goodness, film projectors that would roll in a loop, and the the set was extraordinarily hot. It was very very difficult for the actors to work on it. Yeah, and I can I'm yeah. Sorry, did you say what year? Oh yes. Okay. So uh, how I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb was finished in early 1964. In early 1964, the next week, uh, Stanley Kubrick started working on this since 1964. The film was finished uh, in time for a Christmas release in December of 1968, before the Apollo uh, 8 mission had reached the moon. It, it reached the moon uh, a, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks after the film actually premiered. So no one had actually been to the moon at this time. And uh, one of the things that's really amazing about this movie is that he he employed um, consultants from NASA, which basically took what they knew about the Apollo missions and extrapolated into the future. Um, he consulted with the people that made the spacesuits and figured out like what, what would spacesuits look like in the year 2001, assuming that Apollo progressed at the same rate uh, as it was progressing in the 1960s. Obviously, things slowed down quite a bit. Um, and the, but the, but the effects themselves were all practical. I mean, they, they did weightlessness very, very well, and they did it in an interesting way where they just hung the guys from a ceiling and, and uh, presented, them, uh, presented them as weightless in that way. Um, the film also was very artful in a way. Uh, it, it had a, very, a lot of very unusual looks to it. Stanley Kubrick was very good at, at uh, producing uh, striking sets. Uh, and this particular one, at, near the end of the film, is, uh, uh, the set was actually lit from below, which gives it an eerie, otherworldly feeling. And so even though it was very technologically advanced, it was also very artfully advanced. There's nothing else that really looks like this film. Um, one of the common complaints about this movie is that it is inscrutable. It is very difficult to actually figure out what's going on. And I'm here to tell you that it's not that difficult. Now to preface this, I want to say that Stanley Kubrick himself, in an interview not long after the film was made, was asked what it all means, because there are some very strange things that go on in this movie, and there's no narration or anything like that. They originally planned on having it, but he didn't like it, and he said to the interviewer, um, if you had La Gioconda, do you know what La Gioconda is? That would be the Mona Lisa. If down at the bottom of the Mona Lisa, Le uh, Leonardo da Vinci had put, uh, she's smiling kind of weird because her teeth are bad. Would that improve the Mona Lisa? Would that actually make the Mona Lisa a better, uh, better painting? 
And, and Stanley Kubrick said, no, it wouldn't. The part of the, the best thing about the Mona Lisa is the mystery. The mystery of the film is what gives it its delight. And you can watch it time and time again and see new resonances, see new things in the film every time you see it because these things are not explained. So if you don't understand everything that you see, everything that happens, great, that's the point. The point is for the film to be a little bit inscrutable. It is actually supposed to take you on a journey to something that's a little bit beyond your understanding, which I think is very interesting because that is what science does as well. The learning about the universe takes us a little bit further than what we can understand. And so to me, I think key to the film is the fact that it has kind of this inscrutability. Now some people are, don't really like that. I happen to think it's the, the indelible element of this film. So. That said, uh, of course we should pay attention to one particular element of the film, which was the presence of a black slab in the film, which they call the monolith. They never actually say the word monolith in the film, I think. Um, which, which appears at certain critical uh, branch points in the evolution of humanity. And so, if I were to say one thing that the film was about, at least one of the many things that the film was about, it is about transition. It is about evolution of humanity from one level to another and the process. And um, so, of course, the film starts off with uh, early humans evolving eventually into modern day humans, which have the technology to journey into space, something impossibly remote from this guy right here. This guy would not have understood that at all. However, Stanley Kubrick wanted to take and Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke wanted to take things one step further. He wanted to actually take and show a world that was one step beyond, or at least as far beyond our comprehension as today's world is to the comprehension of this guy. And so this, the monolith shows up at the points where we make the leap to a new level of comprehension and understanding. So here's the monolith with the apes and that happens early in the film, another transition where humans actually venture out into the remote solar system uh, occurs in the middle of the film, and then finally at the end when there's a giant, when there's a transition of humanity into something approaching kind of a godlike being, maybe a cube or something like that, <laughs> uh, something like that. But um, the film is, to me, one of the themes is at least about transitions. What other themes are there? That's for you to decide. Um, and then at the end, the film is pretty wild and amazing, so. <laughs> I mean, what is this all about? Um, I like the fact that this has a very technological feel to it. I like the fact that you don't know what this is supposed to be. And, but it is something that is plausible, something that is just outside of our reach, uh, just outside of our understanding, and we can't comprehend it, but we can examine it and look at it very interestingly. So, one of the things that I really enjoyed as a youth uh, about this movie that made me watch it time and time again, especially when it came on at Night Owl Theater, I used to love watching it on Night Owl <laughs> Theater, um, was how incredibly uh, detailed the film was when it came to the technology and the, pre the presentation of science. And I just wanted to go over a few small things that had to do with um, how accurate the science was. First of all, let's take a look at the, the main spaceship of the, of, the, of the movie, the Discovery One spacecraft. Um, according to the, uh, the people who built the, the model, everything in this spacecraft has a purpose. They actually did not do what uh, modern astronomers, modern uh, filmmakers do, which was called kit bashing. You throw a bunch of pieces together, it looks kind of technological and good, and that's good enough. You know, the Millennium, Millennium Falcon is a bunch of stuff put together, and then people kind of figure out what it's all about after the fact when they watch the movie. They didn't do that here. They said, I want every single little bit, nook, and cranny of this to have a purpose. So they got NASA consultants and say, say if we wanted to get to Jupiter, what would we do? And they said, well, nuclear propulsion would be the way to do it. Well, what are the issues with that? Well, the 
nuclear reactor would have to be a long way from the habitation zone. So they imagine that the nuclear reactor is back here, and the people live up here um, on the other end, 400 feet away. There's a gigantic uh, communication dish on that. And every one of these little pieces has some role in it. Somebody's written something down. So when you watch the movie again, you can try to figure out what every little, what, what every little piece does uh, in the film. Not just on the ships, but in the interiors and on the, in, you know, when uh, Haywood Floyd goes to the bathroom on the way to the moon, the, the instructions for going to the bathroom are printed out. And if you pause the 4K version of the Blu-ray, you can actually read it and it really says something plausible that would actually tell you how to go to the bathroom in zero G, which is really complicated. Um, the other thing I, as they, they did, as I was saying, is they invented computer uh, displays and that kind of thing. They act, they, these were not actually what computer displays looked like in those days. They had to kind of, in their minds, come up with a new way of, of uh, presenting data, and they made hundreds and hundreds of these little loops which actually showed interesting little features of the ship and the mission and that kind of thing. And if you pay attention, you can actually figure out what each one of them means because they thought of every single one of them. This, for example, is the presumed orbit that they take from the Earth to Jupiter. And you notice it doesn't go straight out, it actually goes in a long looping, a long, long looping orbit. They thought of it. So, um, another thing is the role of computers. In those days, as I was saying, of course, computers were the size of large rooms, and um, in the, they figured out that a, you know, a computer would actually be sophisticated enough to play a decent game of chess at that time, which came to pass uh, sometime in the early 1990s or so, a long time before a computer could actually play a decent game of chess. Now, as we will discuss in just a few minutes, um, computers are... Um, much, much more advanced than that. That is a positively trivial thing uh, that it, uh, for a computer to do compared to what it has recently proven able to do in the, uh, today. Uh, other technology um, that it kind of foresaw, um, laptop or uh, iPads, basically, <laughs> desktop computers and that kind of thing. These little, these little tablets play a, a, a small role in the film. And in fact, uh, this particular uh, shot from the film was used in a lawsuit against Apple, which claimed that it invented the idea of what came to be the iPad. And they, they, uh, they were asking for uh, uh, compensation from other people who made other similar computers. The plaintiff, the, 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 the defendant uh, in the case actually presented this image of the film and said, uh, yeah, Stanley Kubrick came up with the idea in 1968. Should we pay him the royalties? Um, no, he's dead. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, the film actually does uh, foresee a number of things into the future quite well. Uh, another thing they did really well was uh, contend with the, uh, the realistic presentation of zero gravity. Uh, most space operas are filmed, of course, on Earth, and it's extremely difficult to facilitate zero gravity uh, while you're standing on Earth, unless you take an airplane and go up and down, or you spend a whole lot of money to go up the International Space Station, which is absolutely uh, irresponsible. Um, but the film itself takes great pains to show you when zero G is actually there, and to make excuses for when the actors are actually got their they've got their feet planted on the ground. So here's one situation where the where the flight uh, attendants are uh, eating, and they're eating uh, out of a straw to, in order to contend with the fact that there's zero G and the food would go flying all over the place. I also like the fact that they're watching judo in the background. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, the film also contends with zero G by creating space stations that get rid of zero G. They actually spin, and if you figure out what the, what the gravity of this particular station is by the amount of spin that it's taking, um, it is a reasonable amount of spin. Uh, one thing that engineers actually pointed out after they saw this is they said, well, if this thing is currently under uh, construction, why would you spin it? Because if you drop a hammer, it would go flying. Um, uh, that would be really bad, so that was one inaccuracy. But the, but the station itself actually uh, spins at, to, in order to reduce gravity, so when the people are walking around in the space station, you can actually see it. Um, another nice little scene in the, in the film, a, plant, a pen is floating around, 
Um, the way they did this, by the way, is they put the, they stuck the pin with scotch tape on a pane of glass and moved the pane of glass around, <laughs> as you'll see in the film. It was really kind of cool. Uh, and the, the, the flight uh, hostess walks up. Notice uh, on the sign, the sign here says, caution, weightless conditions, like, like you wouldn't notice. Um, and in order to excuse the fact that she's uh, uh, standing on the ground, she's wearing Velcro shoes. Shoes there. I always thought they were magnetic, but if you look really closely in the 4K version, it's actually Velcro that she's walking with. So they, they got that right. Um, the spacesuits themselves uh, point up something that I really like about the film, which is the sound of the film. Um, if uh, the, the film is being shot from the point of view of a uh, character, like Dave Bowman here, you hear the sound inside of the spacesuit, and in order to get that, they actually consulted with NASA to put a microphone inside a real honest-to-goodness spacesuit to find out how much noise it was producing, all the quick whooshing and the, the, throughout the film, when, when you're inside a spacecraft, you hear a lot of ventilation fans and whirring, whirring atmosphere coming and going and that kind of thing. And then the breathing of the astronaut itself is a really dramatic part of the film. They weave it into the, into, the, uh, into the film. But for me, the most vitally important thing that this film does that almost no other films do is that when we have a point of view outside of the spacecraft and we are watching action outside of the spacecraft, the sound is dead. There is nothing in the, in the soundtrack. Space is silent because space does not conduct sound. And when you have a spacecraft go over in Star Wars or in, in Star Trek or anything else, you get a whoosh, you know, going across the, going across the, the sky in order to make it more dramatic. I think, personally, that having no sound in space plays up the danger and the isolation of being in space. You have nothing between you and the infinite uh, when, when sound in space is taken off. And I wish more movies would do this. Um, finally, with, uh, I like this little, this little nice little accurate element, um, which is uh, when they dock with the, with the space station here, they actually dock with the center of the space station where the, where the centrifugal acceleration would actually be the least. Um, and, um, they, they, they got that exactly dead on. And then you've got a few more of the little computer monitors here and how it's lining up and everything like that. I really like it. Um, so let's, let's take a look and see how accurate they got it. Um, within the, within the uh, Discovery One spacecraft, um, you actually have uh, this spinning dome and they walk into the spinning dome and then they step onto that. And when they step onto the, the little spinning dome there, they start spinning around and that's then they walk down into the gravity well. I wanted to figure out like what the actual what the actual gravity would be, and I sort of guesstimated the size. I looked it up later. I was a little bit off in you know the canon uh, size, but I'll use my own numbers because I, I like them better. Um, so I guesstimated that the, the, it was about 10 meters to the floor, about 30 feet down. You know that looks about 30 feet to me, something like that. Um, and the way you figure out the centrifugal, centrifugal force <laughs> is uh, this particular, yeah, I get, I'll get to that in just a sec, uh, is you need to figure out radians per second uh, over uh, the radius of the, the spinning. Uh, I counted how long it took this to go around once. It took about 20 seconds to go around once. So if we do the math and we actually figure it out, it turns out that the gravitational acceleration is about one-tenth of a g. So you would weigh one-tenth what you would in the Taurus, which you could probably walk around a little Hi folks, this is Brad Haney again. Um, sorry about the, uh, the glitch here. Um, normally at the CAS meetings, I like to record uh, the talks and post them on the CAS YouTube page. Uh, this time uh, I was doing the talk kind of at the last minute and uh, my organization of the of the camera wasn't really up to snuff, and uh, it turns out the battery died after 23 minutes of recording. Uh, so I don't have the rest of the the talk that uh, I and uh, Don Leonard uh, gave after the uh, uh, after mine was finished. So what I wanted to do here was just spend a few minutes talking a little <laughs> and kind of 
filling out the end of the the end of the talk that I was giving, and uh, I will attempt to work with Don Leonard in the future to pr produce a uh, uh, auxiliary talk uh, that sort of reproduces his if he's up for it. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, since this is going to go into the uh, newsletter of the CAS, the Prime Focus, uh, and onto our Facebook page, I thought I would uh, prepare uh, just a little bit of audio here to uh, talk you through the end of some of the ideas I had about this great movie, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, that I love so much, and uh, I guess I'll get started. So when we left off, uh, the I was talking about uh, the accuracies of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, one of the things that I, I liked about it uh, that I was talking about as the camera cut out was the fact that they used uh, centrifugal force to simulate uh, gravity. I figured out that uh, the amount of gravity that the, that the spinning wheel produced would be around a tenth of a G. Um, I thought that was reasonably plausible. I mean, the guys would be bouncing around a little bit. Uh, I think it's a little light, but uh, it's it works within the context of the film. So, uh, but to continue, um, I wanted to <laughs> share this little uh, ditty about uh, uh, done by XKCD about the difference between centripetal and centrifugal force. Um, you know, if you if you visualize, uh, uh, there's always a a pedant's way of looking at centrifugal force, and uh, the pedant's way is to say, no, centrifugal force is not really a thing. There's no such thing as centrifugal force. But if you look at uh, force uh, in, in a rotating context, if you actually say, okay, uh, the context that I am in is standing, you know, stable on the inside of a, you know, rotating sphere and consider that to be uh, you know, still in the rest of the universe going around you, centrifugal force is actually mathematically a thing. Um, so uh, it's not really... Uh, I, I consider the, the argument that centrifugal force is not a thing to be kind of specious. Uh, one of the other things that I liked about the film was there, there's a very interesting scene in uh, near the end of the movie where Dave Bowman is actually trapped in his uh, space pod and he's trying to get back into the ship. The problem is, of course, uh, to get back into the ship, uh, he has to go in through the emergency airlock. He has forgotten his space helmet. And in order to do that, he would actually have to go through a vacuum. Uh, the film makes a very big deal about about this and gives him the um, uh, uh, it shows him preparing for the for the intensity of actually exposing yourself to the vacuum of space. Uh, he goes into uh, he explodes out into the uh, uh, the airlock, uh, bounces around in the airlock a little bit, closes the door. The door actually gets. Um, the door actually closes, and as soon as it's shut, uh, the air comes in and, and presents, uh, gives him oxygen to breathe, and that is when the sound comes on. I think the fact that he had to make you know, a very intense journey from uh, you know, the, the space pod and into the ship through a vacuum was, was very well done. It, it, I, I like it a lot. One of the things that was kind of pointed out by some people after the film was made was that if you tried to hold your breath <laughs> against the vacuum of space, you're... Uh, you, you would your uh, lungs would actually get injured. It's probably best in space to not hold your breath, to allow the air to burst out of your lungs, and uh, just deal with the uh, lack of oxygen for the few seconds that it took for you to uh, uh, negotiate the closing of the airlock and such. But um, despite that minor quibble, I think it was a very interesting part of the part of the film. Another thing I liked a lot was how accurately it actually pictured um, the the planet Earth. And, you know, in in a, in a lot of other uh, old sci-fi films, the planet Earth kind of looks like an old you know a globe with the you know the United States and the you know the Greenland and the the blue ocean and um, typically there aren't very many clouds on the on the earth, you know on the Earth in these old photographs. It turns out that from Earth. Uh, from space, Earth is actually, you know, mostly blue, a little hazy, a lot of clouds, very bright, uh, very bright planet. It's all, it almost, it, it would almost dazzle you if you're, if you're in orbit. Uh, and to just to kind of show you what this is like, here's a, here's a photograph taken uh, from the Apollo 4 test launch of the, the Saturn V rocket. 
Uh, this is just one one of a sequence of images. If you ever get a chance, go to go to YouTube and actually uh, view the sort of little time lapse that they made out of these. Some some uh, enterprising YouTuber actually created a a time lapse, and uh, NASA actually put it on their YouTube page. It's pretty cool. So just uh, go into YouTube and put in a t Apollo four um, uh, imagery, and it's quite lovely. So here's this is a real photograph, um, and just to compare. Uh, what it looks like with uh, with, the, with the film. Uh, here's here's another uh, picture uh, from low orbit uh, to kind of give you an idea. It's obviously a wide angle lens, so it exaggerates the the curvature of the Earth a little bit, but it gives you a sense that you know the Earth is it's kind of it's it's very colorful and vivid blue, but it's fairly washed out. We don't see real bright striking greens. The land is not very clear. Um, in the film itself does a very similar thing. I mean, this was, uh, this was, uh, the you know, special effects for this film were made at, l at latest in 1968. So um, what we're seeing here is a really accurate representation of, of how uh, the earth actually looks from space. It would be very dazzlingly bright. Um, the air, you know, the quality of the air actually kind of washes out the land a little bit. And uh, I think it's really quite lovely. Uh, another thing that they uh, did very, very well was to imagine how Jupiter would actually look. Um, these are, this is in 1968, before any uh, spacecraft had actually visited the planet Jupiter and given us close-up, given us close-up imagery of that world. Um, the uh, Voyager spacecraft uh, went by Jupiter in 1979. The Pioneer, uh, if I remember correctly, was 76, 77, somewhere around in there. Uh, and sent back some uh, fairly low resolution pictures. Uh, Voyager was a lot better. Um, but until that time, you know, the best uh, pictures we had of Jupiter were these were ground-based images, which were not particularly uh, high resolution. They didn't give a really good you know, impression of the way that Jupiter would actually look. We'd never re resolved anything on the moons of Jupiter. But in the film, uh, they had to imagine what, what Jupiter would look like, and uh, they got it pretty good. I, I think it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite striking how, they, how they, uh, they did this. So on the left here, I presume something looks like, looks like Callisto. I mean, they perhaps knew that Callisto was sort of a chalky gray-blue color. Um, and uh, uh, this I would, the middle one here, would, I presume, would be Ganymede, and then maybe Europa, and then uh, a couple of the other moons there. But uh, they did a very good job. So Jupiter is, is you know, in bright sunlight. It's being washed out. Um, we can see stars in the background, uh, which is not, you know, technically accurate. Jupiter would be very bright and you would be da dazzled by its brilliance, even though it's uh, 1 25th the uh, brightness of the sun. Uh, the sun is 1 25th as bright at that distance. Jupiter is five times further away from the sun, and therefore the sunlight is much dimmer. Um, even so, Jupiter being quite large and uh, in broad daylight would still be rather dazzling and you probably with the human eye would not see stars however and <laughs> I give it a I cut it a little slack in this instance because uh, Jupiter is actually overexposed in this in this picture and they have some glare in the image and it looks like a you know a, a slightly longer exposure uh, photograph than uh, you would uh, presumably get if the if the if, the, uh, if Jupiter was properly uh, exposed in very rich and vivid detail. And so maybe, you know, that, that extra exposure actually gives us the ability to see the stars behind behind um, uh, Jupiter. So I think that was kind of lovely. Uh, I, there's some really quite beautiful, I like the, the fact that we can actually see Jupiter uh, from the night side and see Jupiter as a crescent is quite beautiful. I think the, the great red spot there. I think the color is a little bit oversaturated, but you know, that, that doesn't bother me. Um, there's not real much on the on the right side here that would uh, presumably illuminate uh, this part of the world. Uh, Jupiter is presumably in front of this world a little bit, so we wouldn't get any uh, daytime illumination from this. So I, I guess this is just artistic license. I would chalk that up as a slight inaccuracy in the film. Um, I like this. There's a uh, there's a scene where the monolith is kind of uh, mysteriously drifting through uh, the heavens. And uh, we look back and see the crescent of Jupiter here um, with some of the smaller moons, which they presumed to be roughly spherical. It turns out they're more potato-shaped, but uh, 
uh, but this looks strikingly accurate. Uh, one of the, the sun would be quite a bit more dazzling, and you would definitely not see stars if you were a human being looking back in this direction. But once again, maybe it's overexposed and that kind of thing. Um, putting stars in space has always been kind of artistic license. But compare this imagery to which you know predated any spacecraft. Uh, that had visited Jupiter uh, with an, an actual photograph. This on the right here was taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it passed by Jupiter uh, on its way to Saturn. Um, and it's a lovely crescent and compare it to the film. I just took the film and turned it on its side here. And I think, wow, they got it really, really dead on. I mean, they, they, they knew just what they were doing. Now, obviously this picture doesn't have stars in the background and the sun would probably be not nearly as bright, but, um, or would be quite a bit brighter in reality. Uh, but I think the, the, the lovely crescent and just the hint of some of the bands of Jupiter around the edge, um, is, is a really, really lovely touch. And another little slight detail that I thought was kind of cool. One, one very important part of the film is the uh in the the lunar sequence uh, they go out and visit the the monolith that they had dug up from underneath the surface of the moon um the monolith in the interpretation of the characters in the film uh or i think you could plausibly say that the monolith was actually acting as a, a sort of trip wire to to notify whatever distant uh, sentient entities had placed it there uh, that humanity had actually developed the technology to find it, you know, on the moon instead of on the earth. And uh, the thing that would actually trip it off would be the sunlight hitting it. And so in this scene, um, you actually see the, the lunar surface and the earth. It's it's in the near the crater uh, Tycho, which is fairly close to the uh, the south pole of, of, uh, of the moon, not, not super close, but fairly close. And the, and the earth would actually be in the sky there, It'd probably be a little higher than that. But look at the sunlight hitting the edge of the scene there. The sunlight is kind of creeping up, leading us to think that, yeah, the sunlight is just about ready to come over the horizon and the moon, this, Op this object was presumably dug up just recently. Maybe it's been lunar night the whole time and it's never actually been exposed to sunlight. And in the next scene, just a few seconds later, as they walk down, you see that the sunlight is actually, it's getting a little stronger. It's actually peeking up over the, over the horizon and starting to creep across the, creep, it, creep across the landscape. I mean, the time has been compressed a little bit in this setting, but clearly the sun is starting to rise. And given that this is critical for the film, um, I think it's, it's pretty interesting to note that. Now, I, I do think that the, the monolith would actually be a little bit low and the sun would have to actually spend a few days getting up to this height in order to come down and see the moon, but presumably maybe it's responding to sunlight hitting something nearby and, and, a, and a bright change in sunlight. So um, I thought that was a rather nice little touch that the sun was actually coming up. Now, given that, uh, I think uh, one of the other things I wanted to kind of uh, point up was not just what it got right, but, you know, for a film that is noted for its prescience and its ability to kind of predict the future and ability to present physics and space in a very accurate way, it does get a few things uh, pretty pretty wrong. And just for fun, I wanted to kind of point out a few of those things as well. Um, so one of the things I, I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit was um, that very moonrise or that very uh, sunrise that we were just looking at. And the place that they were uh, going from to uh, uh, actually go to the the monolith was called Clavius Base, which is presumably near Clavius Crater. Now we see that Clavius Base is very near the uh, the south pole of the moon here, as seen from Earth. So this this would mean that from this location, if you were standing in the the floor of Clav you know, Clavius Crater, the Earth would actually be very low on the horizon, which is actually fairly accurate. 
uh, fairly accurately presented to the moon. The, the, the Earth is very close to the horizon. However, in order to see the monolith, they go up to what's the, near the crater Tycho, is what one of the background sounds say. And so that's way up here. And the Earth would actually not be right hovering on the horizon there. It would actually be a little bit higher. And if you look at the you look at the film itself, the Earth is right on the horizon. I think it's actually a little bit too big for the for the angle of the of the shot as well. Um, if they're doing it a little bit dramatically, over dramatically here. Another thing I want you to look at is the way the moon is actually presented. The, the surface is actually quite rough. Uh, it's very much in the classic 1950s conception of the moon with lots of rugged edges, a lot of Chelsea bonus style um, paintings from that era presented the moon as very rough. And the reason why people thought that is because when you look at the moon through a telescope uh, and you look along the lunar terminator, the line between night and day, the, the shadows are very sharp and, and, and uh, uh, the relief is rather highly exaggerated and the main reason for that is there's no atmosphere on the moon and there's nothing to kind of soften the shadows and we see them side long and that makes the from a visual sense from a from an artistic uh, from a earthly perspective uh, the the mountain the mountains look very high and very jagged so what uh, artists tended to do was they tended to think that, that that represented reality more or less. But as it turns out that you know we actually visited the moon and sent uh, lunar orbiters and things like that and took pictures of the limb of the moon and uh, when you look at them close up it turns out that they're quite a bit different. This is a, a picture from the Apollo 17 space mission and you can see that uh, the uh, this is typical for lunar mountains. I mean, they're they're big. I mean, these are probably a couple miles high, uh, but they're also very smooth. They've been weathered over the eons by minor lunar quakes and and impacts and things like that. The material getting laid down on top of the mountains when a huge uh, impact event happens and that kind of thing, and that averages out all of the uh, uh, rugged edges. You know, the rugged peaks of the mountains and makes the moon a lot smoother than. Uh, it was in art. So the actual look of the moon um, was not quite on target. You, in fact, if you look through a telescope now and you look at the limb of the moon through a telescope at high power, you can kind of see through a telescope that it, the, the edge of the moon and the mountains are not that rugged. I mean, it, people could have figured it out in those days, but artistically people tended to represent it um, in, in this way rather than in the way that it actually looked. So that was very common at the time. Um, now, there was another thing I wanted to, to kind of point out here. Uh, there's a uh, there's a sequence here where the uh, shuttlecraft or whatever it is uh, land, you know, takes Haywood Floyd, the only passenger on the ship, down to the moon. And this, I think, is one of the most one of the most hilariously inaccurate parts of the film for an amateur astronomer, someone who is familiar with the moon and familiar with the phases of the, of the moon and how it looks and that kind of thing. And it looks like um, when they did this sequence, they just kind of threw up random pictures of the moon in order to in order to uh, uh, you know, give a sense of being at the moon. But if you look really closely, you can actually see that uh, they, they pick from just all over the place in order to do this. And it would not make sense in terms of what's happening. We presume that this, uh, this landing all takes place within a few hours, perhaps. And uh, so I will show this. And as, as it goes along, I'll actually talk about it here. Let's see if it actually plays in this. Yes, so here we go. We're going down to the, we're going down to the surface of the moon. Now look at the phase. This is actually a late... Uh, or this is actually an early uh, crescent phase. So this is like a four day old moon. I'll stop it here. Um, and like for a four day old moon, you're, that's the one that you're seeing in the evening. It's a crescent moon. Now this shot right here is actually completely a, a completely different phase. This is actually a, a rough, roughly a, a third quarter moon, which would be eh, more than two weeks later. You know, this is... Uh, this is the uh, uh, Mare Imbrium, there's Plato, this is uh, uh, Crater Copernicus, I'm trying to remember, this one's Aristarchus, I'm thinking? Uh, uh, this, one, this one's Aristarchus, okay, this, this is Archimedes here. 
and th these are all over on the other side of the moon. So this side is being illuminated now, uh, just presumably within a few, like an hour earlier or however long it took them to, to go down to the surface of the moon. Um, now the moon is completely differently illuminated. But let's keep going. We'll see it again here. I mean, it's a beautiful picture of the moon. That's Copernicus. There's Kepler right there in that one. Uh, there's Arzachel. And so it's quite nice. I like uh, seeing that Haywood Floyd likes to look out the window and watch the landing. I mean, he's not completely jaded. They present him in the film as this, this being rather uh, fairly Act, you know, fairly uh, jaded by spaceflight. He's probably done it a lot. One of the things they got NASA scientists to um, consult on this, and one of the, the when they built this uh, little space pod here, um, they wanted to have a space pod that was actually the most uh, uh, structure that have, would have the most structural integrity. Now, uh, look at the background. We've got a very dark image, and this is just a picture of the moon that's been reduced in brightness. And we're once again looking at the, the sort of uh, third quarter side of the moon. Um, so the, this was, uh, oh, watch the, okay, so I'm going to stop this here. Uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, about the spacecraft here. So they wanted to uh, make the spacecraft have the most structural integrity. And the way to do that is to have a sphere. The, the, the pressure on the inside is most evenly distributed on the interior of the spacecraft if it's actually a sphere. So that's how they made it. That's how they made it about that and uh, I want you to watch very carefully the the, the position the position of the earth uh, here so the earth you know we're, we're seeing uh, you know the night side over here the day side over here and uh, as it goes down now watch the uh, watch the shot as it goes down and watch what happens to the earth once again we got those rough mountains again those very craggy peaks I mean, it's quite beautiful. I like that they have red light for night for night lighting. You know, that's that that makes a lot of sense. If they're if they're landing in the dark, uh, which they are in the context of the film, um, they're landing in the dark uh, because the sun has not come up to illuminate the monolith later on in the film. So uh, all the illumination in the foreground here would be uh, from the brilliant Earth in the sky. And so in order to be able to see out the window, they have red lights in order to preserve their night vision, which is kind of cool. And so here's the space station. I think this is an overly optimistic space station for the era. This is a very low resolution capture. I, I know I stole it off the internet, so um, it's not a real good, not a real good capture of this. But uh, okay, so now uh, we get the uh, you know, foreground being illuminated by the bright earth, that doesn't look as bright, bright enough. But um, look at the position of the earth. The earth is actually illuminated from the other side now. And uh, so they, they kind of forgot. What I think might have happened was when they were filming this, this is obviously what's called rear projection. Rear projection is uh, when, you, when you film uh, you know, actors in, in front of a, a scene and you want to have something going on in the background that you know you can't afford to do on, on, on location. You know, obviously Stanley Kubrick did not go to the moon, uh, contrary to some conspiracy theorists, um, to actually film uh, the lunar landing. Uh, so this was done in a studio and they built a little foreground here and the background is just a, a huge screen that is projecting thing, projecting whatever it is that they wanted to project. Uh, they also did that in the the Dawn of Man sequence at the beginning of the film as well. There was a lot of they didn't actually film most of it in in Africa. They sent out a second unit director to go out and shoot a bunch of shots in Africa, and then bring back uh, the the footage, and then they would all film it in a studio in London. And I think what happened was when they projected this, they didn't realize they they forgot that it would actually give a mirror image of the earth they didn't they didn't actually reverse the film and flip it back around and that was I think that was just a glitch in the in the film so the earth is in the wrong way so we've got the uh, spacecraft coming down here it's landing straight down I think it's quite lovely and uh, the guy has a little camera there gets it out they don't have cell phones <laughs> I was never quite sure why they would why they would actually cover up the uh, 
uh, the landing site. You know, perhaps they're they're worried about space dust or micrometeorites or something like that. But uh, but uh, it seems to me like it, it would make more sense just to leave it in the open and not worry about it, just to harden the harden the uh, the landing area. But it makes for a really cool uh, effect. I think this was probably not really well thought out. So once again, the Earth is back going the other direction. And I think the uh, the the pilots there would be uh, dazzled by the by the uh, brilliance of the Earth, given the the fact that the sun hasn't hadn't come up yet. So I think the Earth should have been brighter. Uh, I like the little now. Uh, really important in this, uh, obviously the the uh, lunar environment doesn't have a, a an atmosphere. I mean, it has a very very thin atmosphere with a you know a few atoms per cubic centimeter or something like that. A very small amount. Uh, that, that kind of rises up from the surface of the moon, but it's not nearly enough to actually cause any wind or turbulence effects and that kind of thing. So when something lands on the moon and there's dust around, that dust is going to go flying out in one direction. It's going to make a parabolic arc off to where it eventually lands and hits the surface of the moon again or flies out into space, uh, depending on how fast it's going. In this case, obviously, they're not able to film it in a vacuum. I mean, I Presumably, they could have got put it in a, in a vacuum, but they didn't. And when this uh, craft lands, uh, the clouds actually billow. Uh, this is something that would allow you to tell whether or not someone was filming something on a studio rather than an actual vacuum. Uh, in this case, the clouds billow, and clearly it's being filmed in a studio with an atmosphere. It's quite, it's quite a beautiful shot, but uh, it, it's scientifically not very plausible it's not accurate and so it goes down it lands i like the little shock absorbers it's got there that's kind of cool and they bring it down into the into the space station i always thought that this was a bit superfluous but i think it's still kind of cool it makes it quite lovely it's beautiful beautiful technology and they take it down this would be a lot easier by the way on the moon than it would be on the earth uh to actually take it down into the um into the uh uh, lunar habitat here below ground, you know, away from the radiation and micrometeorites above, uh, quite, quite wonderful. And I mean, it would be much easier to do that on the moon because the, the gravity is one sixth that of earth. And so this particular mechanism would not have to be as you know, quite as strong. Uh, and so it would be probably technologically a lot easier to manufacture on the moon if, you know, we had enough resources there. Um, so Finally, uh, at the uh, at the meeting, we actually uh, gave a little uh, we had a little chit chat with uh, Don Leonard about uh, the current situation uh, with AI, and uh, I've been astounded at how good a few of the gen uh, language the generative language models have been lately. Basically, a generative language model is something that uses uh, a learning, a computer learning process to actually figure out what the next word is in a in a uh, in, in a paragraph that is currently writing, and it, it does it with a very complex set of uh, uh, neural networks, and can produce astonishingly good, astonishingly accurate text. I mean, it does a really good job of simulating what a human would write. For me, sometimes the the writing that it produces tends to be kind of like a college student sorting sort of trying to pad out a paper that needs to be a certain number of words but it actually sounds fairly accurate I mean it's it sounds plausible to me I mean when I when I when I read it I wouldn't be able to tell if it was you know uh, written by a you know an eighth grader or, or chat GPT sometimes I mean it's actually quite uh, uh, advanced I mean it's in to my mind it's actually passed the so-called Turing test that is the inability for a human that you know, doesn't have any other indication of you know the origin of the of the of the uh, the text or the or the artwork comes from. Um, it's actually reached a point where now it's exceptionally difficult for you and I to tell whether or not this uh, this content was produced by this generative AI or by a human being. So in that sense, it's actually reached a level that uh, uh, was established a long time ago by Alan Turing to. Uh, determine whether or not we could consider something to be intelligent. 
and I think we've reached that point. I mean, it's, it's astonishing how good it's gotten. Uh, so the film itself has uh, a few amazing, I mean, uh, predictions about how, how intelligent computers will be. Obviously in the film, uh, the most well-known character in 2001 A Space Odyssey is in fact a computer. It's the HAL 9000 computer. And he talks, uh, you know, through obviously a voice actor at the time, a guy named Douglas Rain, who's got a great voice. And he uh, uh, chit-chats uh, in a natural way with the, uh, uh, the two crew members that he's, that he's traveling with and uh, gives plausible answers very quickly. Uh, but he has some uh, rather extraordinary abilities that, uh, you know, just five years ago, I would have thought to be highly improbable, highly implausible. And one of the ones I'll just I'll just talk about this very this one particular uh, talent that it had that existed in uh, that now exists today that Hal actually did in the film. Um, and that's the ability for the computer to recognize human faces in a wide variety of contexts. Um, in this uh, scene in the movie, the uh, uh, Dave Bowman is actually practicing art. He's making some sketches and he holds up the artwork to uh, the eyeball here of the HAL 9000 computer and the HAL is actually able to identify, oh, that's Dr. Hunter. You know, it's, it's the, uh, one of the crew members and it's a sketch. I mean, it was produced by a human being. It's obviously imperfect. It's, there's very little information uh, to allow the HAL to actually figure it out, but he's able to do that. Um, AI, can do that very well now. I mean, there is a program on my cell phone that will present me um, with faces that I have uh, taken pictures of over the years. You know, I've got a whole bunch of pictures of my my my, fam my family, my friends, um, and it will sort them all into different uh, contexts and people with different haircuts, different. Uh, uh, different lighting conditions, uh, you know, all over, the, all over the place, my cell phone can actually tell me with astonishing accuracy, you know, all the instances of, you know, my wife Lucia in, in my phone. So, I mean, there's, it'll give me 50 pictures of her that I've taken, uh, you know, in, in many different contexts with many different uh, hairstyles, different glasses, different clothing, uh, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. And the film actually, uh, you know, predicted that. And that has in some sense come to pass. I think a HAL 9000 computer, something that is able to to uh, react in a rather human-like way and do some human-like things, as well as be a computer at the same time, is entirely plausible these days. We've actually reached that point. And I think that's one of the things that inspired uh, Don to actually suggest that maybe we talk about this. Um, I will uh, get with Don and see if he wants to kind of redo his talk and maybe we can record it and I will post it on uh, the CAS webpage um, and uh, the, or the CAS Facebook page and uh, our YouTube page as well if that does in fact come to pass. But until then, uh, I will sign off and I thank you for sticking with me until the very end. Uh, I like sharing uh, my joy in this particular uh, film with you guys. I hope you uh, at least get a chance to see it someday. Uh, it is available on some uh, streaming services now. I, I believe uh, Amazon Prime actually has it right now, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it is widely available to to uh, to to watch and. Uh, Watch on a big screen. I mean, you know, if you got a friend with a big four or eight K TV, it's it's a really spectacularly good film to watch. Uh, the sound is great, the music is great, um, and uh, just you know, sit down, relax, get into its vibe. And uh, uh, if you find that you liked it, uh, you know, send me an email at uh, primefocus at columbusastronomy.org and uh, let me know what you thought of it. And I'd love to hear from you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, and I will be signing off. This is Brad.